QuickBooks Online 2024, adjusting entry related to depreciation. Get ready and some coffee because we're gonna make our books shine with QuickBooks Online 2024. First, a word from our sponsor. Yeah, uh, actually we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers, they don't wanna be seen with us. but. But that's okay, whatever. Because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like this CPA thinking cap, for example. CPA thinking CAP, you see what we did with like with the letters? And this CPA thinking cap is not just for CPAs either. Anyone can and should have at least one, possibly multiple CPA thinking caps. Why? Because based on our scientific survey of five people, all of whom directly profit from the sale of these CPA thinking caps, wearing this CPA thinking cap without a doubt, according to the survey, increases accounting productivity tenfold. Yeah, at least. Yeah, apparently the hat actually channels like accounting energy from the quantum field ether directly into your head allowing you to navigate spreadsheets faster. It's kind of like how in like the Matrix when Neo learns Kung Fu, or at least that's what the scientific survey is saying. So get one, because the scientific survey participants could really use some extra cash. If you would like a commercial free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. Here we are in our Jig Ray Guitars 2024 QuickBooks Online sample company file. We set up in a prior presentation, opening the major financial statement reports like we do every time. The reports on the left in the favorites were right clicking on that balance sheet to open a link in a new tab, right clicking the PL to open a link in a new tab, right clicking the trusty TB trial balance to open a link in a new tab, tabbing to the right. Closing the hamburger, changing the range, going from 010124 tab, 02924 tab, selecting the drop down to see it month by month, side by side, running it, tabbing to the right, closing the hamburger, changing the range again, 010124 tab, 02924 tab, dropping down for the month, running it. One more time, tapping to the right, closing the hamburger, changing the range in 010124 tab, 02924 tab, drop down, months, refresh. Tabbing to the balance sheet, remembering we're doing adjusting entries, those done at the end of the month or year, the period in, the cutoff date, to get the financial statements more closely related to whatever basis being used, oftentimes the accrual basis, but same process could be applied for a cash basis or a tax basis, depending on what your needs may be. So we're now looking at the depreciation, accumulated depreciation, depreciation expense related to the fixed asset accounts, which could be called property, plants, and equipment, PP&E, depreciable assets could be called. And this is going to be one that you can't really avoid, meaning if you're in the United States and you're saying, hey, look, I want to be in a cash-based system. Why? Because it's easier and therefore that's what I'm going to do. But for the taxes, they're still going to force you to break out the fixed assets according to the tax code. So you're going to have to deal with it in that case. It's also something that intuitively we kind of say, hey, look, I feel like I need to make an, a departure from the cash-based system for this particular item. And that makes the most sense if we think about like buying a building, right? If I bought a building for a million dollars, even if I had the cash on hand, then if I was to expense it over here, and I just called it building expense on the income statement, we would end up with a large loss in the month or year of that expense when we purchased the building, which makes no sense from a comparative standpoint. If I looked at January compared to February, a million dollar building expense in January versus no building expense in February does not seem correct. What seems more correct is that we are investing in the building and the building is uh, benefiting January and February evenly. So we should, that's what the accrual method basically does. So most of us, when, if we were to buy a building, even with cash, would say, okay, yeah, I got to put it on the books as an asset. It's not a building expense. That don't make no sense. That doesn't make any sense. 
So we put it on the books as an asset. Other type of uh, assets are going to be similar in nature. So anything that's a large purchase is likely more of an investment than something that we're expensing in the current period. That would include furniture, oftentimes furniture and fixture, build uh, machinery, buildings and land, that kind of thing. Similar concept as we saw with the prepaid insurance, where basically we're, we're paying for the thing before we use it, therefore putting it on the books as an asset and then depreciating it or expensing it as we consume it. Now, unlike the prepaid insurance, however, we are going to create a separate account for the, the assets that we're purchasing and the decrease in those assets, which we're going to call accumulated depreciation, the income statement half being depreciation expense. Why the added step? Why, if, for example, this furniture and fixture was bought for 98000 and then the accumulated depreciation is 7005 so the book value is 90500 When I did that for the insurance, what we did is we took the 12000 and we just reduced the prepaid insurance as we consumed it by 1000 to get to a new prepaid amount, 11 months worth instead of 12 months worth, 11000 so why don't I just do that here? Why wouldn't I just reduce the furniture and fixture account itself? One reason would be that it's an estimate. We still have whatever the furniture and fixture was. If this was one building, for example, we still have one building. So, and it's an estimate in terms of, I don't know how much the building went down by or what would be the appropriate amount exactly to apply to each period. There's different methods that we could use to do that. What we do know is it doesn't make sense to just expense it all in one period. So we have to use some kind of method to allocate the cost. One way we can communicate that to the reader is to say, look, this is what we paid for it. This is the amount that we have allocated and expensed thus far, which should typically in theory represent the decrease or decline in the value of the asset. This is the book value, which may not necessarily match the fair market value. Now, also note that some people might say that we should be putting our books, our furniture and our fixed assets on the books at fair market value. There's a there's a tendency these days to say we should have the balance sheet at fair market value. And you can make an argument for that. However, it's difficult to actually do that uh, because with the furniture and fixture or let's say it was a building. The building is unique in nature. There's no way I can know exactly what the fair market value is. We'd have to take an appraisal of it. And even that is just an estimate. And we know whenever we have leeway for estimates, people will try to try to push the, the border of how great or small the estimate is depending on what they want to do, right? So that's why it kind of makes sense to still use a depreciable cost when we think about property, plants, and equipment, notice that's different than other assets. If we had like stocks and bonds, for example, investments in stocks and bonds that were publicly traded, it makes more sense there to say, hey, look, I'm going to do this according to the fair market value. Because with stocks and bonds, we if they're traded on an exchange, I know how much equivalent stocks are trading for and therefore valuing uh, is a lot easier, makes more sense. But again, with buildings, cars, equipment, they're, they're similar in nature to others, but unique, and they're not often sold in, at the same pace. They're not sold like all the time. All right, that's the argument for why we need to do it. So then how do we do it? Well, when we purchase the furniture and the fixture, we're going to put it on the books as an asset. It's usually going to be pretty easy to, to record the purchases because there's not going to be a lot of them. So we don't buy buildings every day. It's not part of the normal cycle. When I select the drop down up here, I don't see a form that is designated strictly to purchasing assets because it's not something that happens in the normal cycle. If we paid cash for it, we might have an expense form or check form that we would use, but it's possible we finance the equipment, in which case we would still possibly have to use a journal entry type form uh, for the purchase of uh, the equipment. We also have to be careful when we're using bank feeds with the equipment because some suppliers might provide us with both large purchases and small supplies. So if on Office Depot, for example, 
We might have it going automatically to supplies expense whenever we see something come through the bank feeds for Office Depot. But if we paid $16,000 for something, it's likely then that we shouldn't be simply expensing it, but putting it on the books as an asset. So from a bookkeeping perspective, if we're trying to automate our system, we want to put in some internal controls to basically catch the fact that we might have some things that we should be depreciating rather than expensing in the current period. One of those internal controls could be a dollar limitation saying, if a transaction is over a certain dollar, which is going to be somewhat arbitrary, like a thousand or five thousand dollars depending on how large your company is then we we're going to say don't just expense it but rather let me at least look at it or possibly we're going to automatically put it on the books as you know an asset that's a rule you can make for the bank feeds so we can kind of automate that we'll talk about bank feeds in a future course or section as we add this information into our furniture and fixtures there's going to be a sub ledger for it in a similar fashion as we saw with other accounts like the accounts receivable having a sub ledger broken out by customer and possibly more to the point or closer to what we're looking at inventory, which has a sub ledger breaking out by item. The furniture and fixture is going to have a sub ledger also broken out by not inventory items, but the pieces of furniture and fixture or property plant and equipment that we have. Unlike inventory, however, we typically do not track the subledger within QuickBooks. QuickBooks doesn't have as detailed a subledger unless possibly you go into some advanced versions of the software. And one reason for that is that you're still going to need to track the categories for tax software. So in the United States, the tax code is more specific about the categorizations of equipment and the depreciation regulations related to them, which change on a year by year basis. So therefore, it, it just makes sense to put it into the tax software. Otherwise, you're going to have two separate basically depreciation schedules that will get messy to uh, to 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 regulate and, and keep in line with each other. So basically, the idea would be we're going to put this information into our system and we're going to provide it to the tax preparer, possibly giving the tax preparer access to the QuickBooks file. And as we enter transactions for the purchase of equipment, we want to make sure that we give the related documentation to our tax preparer so they can put it on the books, not just as 5,000 generically labeled furniture and fixture, but for the actual things that we put on the book. So it might look something like this. We've got furniture and fixture category. We got machinery and equipment category. Under those categories, we have the actual items, sofas, chairs, uh, recliners and this is just like a summary of examples we would want to be even more specific than this if we can actually if there's a if there's like a, a a number for the items that we're looking at like if it works cars and has license plates and stuff like that then we want the license number so we can identify exactly which piece of equipment we're talking about if it's a sofa or something we might want to actually describe it a little bit more in depth so that we can identify exactly what it is. Note that this problem of identifying these items and making sure that we break out each item, not grouping them together in the subledger. In other words, we shouldn't have like five sofas grouped together as one fifteen thousand dollar amount. Why? It'll come to it'll everything will come and hit the fan when we dispose of these types of items. So when we put these on the books. We could cheat like that. We can do it really easy. I could say, ah, generic furniture and fixtures on the books for 15,000, which actually represents five sofas or something that are on the books. But when we sell the sofa or, or when we dispose of it, then we need to take it off the books. And that becomes a problem if you have it on the sub ledger as one number and that one number is something generic like furniture and fixture. You don't know which one is which. So it's going to be difficult to take it off the book. So you want to be working with a accountant that that properly is going to be able to break out the purchases with the help of the QuickBooks file, as well as possibly you can attach the purchase details uh, to your forms, your purchasing forms within QuickBooks, so they can properly uh, identify each particular item for when you sell them so that you can make it easy on the sales type of thing. This schedule is pretty, pretty simple when you start. 
But if you have a business that's been in business for like 10 years, the schedule will get messy. So you want to try to get it right from the start or else you're going to end up with a kind of a mess at some point uh, in the future. That's going to be the general idea. Now note that everything that was on the books prior to the current year is probably not going to change unless you sold or disposed of fixed assets, which doesn't happen all the time, right? We don't sell things that are sofas all the time. So when we do, we have to identify those and let the accountant know about them so that we can properly adjust our books for the decreases. But the general rule would be that the, the stuff we did last year, if everything's on the book last year, well, great. And then in the current year, this represents the current year, we have to give them the changes that happened, which would be the disposals as well as the new purchases. The new purchases would clearly be in our books as we purchase them. And then again, they can add the new purchases to the books. Now note, when we do dispose of, a, of, a, of something, that's another area to kind of keep in mind. There's a couple of ways you might deal with that. Let's say you sold this sofa here. How would you deal with that? Well, uh, you, you, you could just basically put it on the books at a cash-based method, right? And then tell your accountant at the end of the year to adjust it according to the depreciation schedule. That would be the easiest thing to do because they're gonna have to account for the fact that you have tax depreciation on it and book depreciation might be different than that. Or you might communicate with your accountant and ask them, give me the depreciation schedule and help me record the transaction. Because if I sell this sofa, I gotta take it off the cost side and I have to take it off of the uh, accumulated uh, depreciation. So sometimes it's easier to do that like at the end of the year when you actually do the tax return because then you'll be able to get these schedules. So you might just, you know, record it kind of on a cash based system, make sure you mark it down so that when you do your taxes at the end of the year, you can have an adjusting entry that will help to account for that. And then the new purchases are going to go on the books here. All right, next thing we want to understand is that is that when we first get the chart of accounts within QuickBooks, if I go to this first tab here, and I go into my uh, transactions, and then my chart of accounts, QuickBooks gives you this whole huge list of fixed assets. And it's it's way out of control too long, typically, because they're trying to accommodate every use that you might have for the fixed assets and all the different things and ways you might account for it. But oftentimes for, for small businesses or any business, you want to, to have your fixed assets accounts lined up in the same format as will be on the sub ledger, which is often done in tax software. So when you first set up your chart of accounts, you want to ask your accountant, hey, what are the categories for the sub ledger that's going to be created in the software? For example, furniture and fixture and machinery and equipment. And then try to, when you purchase things, maybe talk to the accountant there as well so you could properly categorize your items when you purchase them into these categories so that our categorizations on our books will match the categorizations on the sub ledgers. If they don't, again, you can kind of deal with it for a while, but then it gets messy uh, over time. So that's the next thing we want to note. Also, the tax code has its own depreciation schedule. So the tax code is different, has its own purposes for depreciation. So they might have a 179 or a special depreciation, accelerated depreciation uses makers instead of a straight line or, or standard double declining, mid-year convention, all this kind of stuff that's more specific possibly than uh, what you might use on the bookkeeping side of things. So then the question is for a small business, uh, do, I wanna, do I wanna just keep my books on a tax basis depreciation? Why would I do that? Because it's easy, that would be the easiest thing to do. So if I'm doing my books uh, in QuickBooks just primarily so I can be in compliance with the tax code, to do my taxes, then the easiest thing to do is just to, to use the tax depreciation for, for my books as well. And that'll be, and that'll be the, the easiest thing to do. However, if you want more detail on the books side, because the tax depreciation is not exactly uh, the best method to use, because there's other reasons why, you know, they're trying to stimulate the economy or depress the economy or get money or whatever they're trying to do over there. Where, where it's not 
it's not designed just for the best reporting for decision making. So you might then ask your accountant, hey, look, I would like you to, to do the taxes. And since you're doing the sub ledger, also use a straight line method or standard double declining method for book depreciation and give me that information so I can have internal records, not on a tax depreciation, but on a book depreciation. So they should be able to do that. Most good tax software will allow you to both do the tax depreciation. And if you want something different for your internal bookkeeping to use a book depreciation, that will mean that the, the categories will be basically the same. Typically you got furniture and equipment, machinery and equipment and so on, but the depreciation methods being used will differ from tax. This is a book depreciation using straight line tax will use makers which is a, a form of accelerated, similar to double declining balance depreciation with a mid-month convention typically. So, so that's the next thing to kind of note. Do I want to use just the tax depreciation or do I want the book depreciation? Also realize if you're a small business, you might only be looking to get a Schedule C, uh, uh, which means you only really need the income statement. Uh, and then the tax preparer is also gonna need your fixed assets to to do the depreciation, which is a balance sheet account. They have to do that accrual component. So, so you might think, well, you know, I, I, the, the tax return doesn't have the balance sheet, but it does have certain kind of parts of the balance sheet, right? It has the, the fixed assets part of the balance sheet, even if you're a sole proprietor, because it's doing the depreciation schedules to calculate the depreciation. So even if you're a schedule C, it's still good that, that, that you have your QuickBooks with a full accounting system with a balance sheet and an income statement. And it would be nice to track then the fixed assets within it. So you can have some kind of check or regulation on, on how the, that transaction is being, being processed. Right? So that's going to be the general idea. So in, in our system, then what we did is we took, uh, we took the numbers given by QuickBooks and then we adjusted our accounts so that we had furniture and fixture and machinery and equipment. So then the next question is, well, what, what happens with the accumulated depreciation accounts? Because that's going to be the decrease. I need another account. So there's two methods you can use for that. You could have one accumulated depreciation account, which is going to be for all of the property, plant and equipment, building, cars, machinery and equipment, furniture and fixture, land. Land won't be depreciated, but you can have one account that would be the easiest thing to do. But I think it's probably what most people will want to do is make an accumulated depreciation account per category, because that's how the sub ledger works. You've got the category, and then you've got the subtotal, and then you've got the accumulated depreciation and depreciation for each category. So that way you can kind of tie out to your sub ledger by category. So that's what we did here. We've got furniture and equipment. We used this as the parent account, and then we made the accumulated depreciation subordinate to it just for that category so that I can get the book value, the difference between the two per category. And then we could collapse it if we want to, to see one line item. We can collapse the whole thing if we want to. Also realize that you might first think using these subcategories, you could do these subcategories two different ways. I could create a furniture and fixture category and then have two accounts underneath it subordinate to it, the cost and the accumulated depreciation. That kind of makes sense. That's how the subcategories usually work. But I find it works pretty good this way by putting the, the parent account I'm actually posting to called furniture and fixtures and then the subcategory accumulated depreciation attached to it. This way you, you save yourself one line there's not two lines, there's only one line uh, for it. So it's a little bit shorter of a statement. And if you have two accounts below the parent account, one called cost, one called accumulated depreciation, it'll be alphabetically order backwards, right? The accumulated depreciation will have an A, so it might be before the cost of the C within that category. So that's kind of a, that's why I think this method, or those are the reasons I think this method works good. So if I go to the first tab here, you can see what we did, furniture and equipment, and then accumulated depreciation as the sub account of the furniture and equipment, and then machinery and equipment, and then accumulated depreciation as the sub account. 
Okay, so once you have all this set up like this, like pretty, then then everything should roll forward pretty easily if you have a good a good CPA, a good uh, accountant helping you with the sub ledgers. And typically, I think a lot of small businesses will do this on a yearly basis, meaning they'll they'll do their when their taxes are done, then you can get the depreciation schedules from your from your uh, accountant or your tax preparer and you can enter an, an adjusting entry into the system once a year. Now you could do it on a monthly basis if you wanted to, uh, if you needed more detail on that, because the, the, the tax uh, software will typically be able to create a depreciation schedule for the current period, as well as the future period. So you could take the accumulated depreciation for the year, for example, and uh, divide it by 12 and you know do a monthly adjustment if you wanted to and then shore it up uh, at the end of the year once the tax return is prepared for internal reporting purposes. So that's another method uh, that you could use. Okay, so then, so then, th so now we'll just do the journal entry. So now we're gonna say we got the furniture and fixtures. Here's the, uh, the cost. Here's last year's depreciation. I know it's a little bit staggered here but this is uh, last year's depreciation was 7,500. And then, and that's these numbers, I believe, if we add these up. And then this year, it came out to 14,001. And what we're doing is taking each of these uh, amounts and applying whatever method we're using, in our case, a straight line uh, type method. So we're using a, a straight line depreciation method. And you can see even using the basic straight line method, it's still quite complex, given the fact that we're depreciating differently every purchase that, that took place. The tax code tries to simplify it using a mid-month convention instead of trying to get it down to the day or even the month of, uh, of when it was purchased. But still, you have, to, you have to depreciate it for each of these line items. So it gets kind of messy. Uh, so in any case, so the current period, we have the 14,000. And for us, we only have two months that have passed. So we're going to say our cutoff is that two month instead of a year. So if it was for a year, we would, it would be easy. We'd take that 14,001. But if it's for two months, I'm going to take the 14,001 divided by 12. That would be 1166 per month times two. So I'm going to say it's going to be 2333.5 for the first two months. Now, I'm not gonna go back and make an adjusting entry for the end of January. If I wanted to do that, I could for a month by month breakout, but I'm making things correct as of the cutoff date for whatever reason we need as of this point, possibly if I needed like a loan or something at the end of February for the two month period or whatever. So I'm gonna make it correct as of this point in time. That's the general idea. So I'm gonna go then, so we could do this with a journal entry and we're gonna create a journal entry, but there's only two accounts affected, so I might wanna do it simply with the register. So I'll go into the furniture and fixture, accumulated depreciation register, because all balance sheet accounts have a register, and then I'll select the drop down and make a journal entry. So I'm gonna say this is as of 022924, all adjusting entries are as of the cutoff date, in our case, the end of February. I'm gonna identify adjusting entry, and then this is where it gets confusing. This is why, again, debits and credits, even with these two accounts affected, are better right? because this gets confusing. It's like, okay, well, is it a decrease or, a de or an increase? Why is that confusing? Well, if I go to the balance sheet here, note that, that the furniture and fixture uh, is a normal asset and the accumulated depreciation is what we call a contra asset, meaning from a debit and credit standpoint, it has a credit balance instead of a debit balance and all other assets have a debit balance instead of a credit balance. So accumulated depreciation goes up with a credit, whereas all other accounts that are assets go up with debits typically. And so, so, then, so then the question is, well, does, does QuickBooks see this as an increase uh, to that account as a credit or a debit? It's hard to tell, you know? So if you go the wrong way, then you could just go in there and kind of flip it flip it around that's why the the debits and and how does why does that happen by the way just note that that happens contra assets typically happen because this account is actually broken out from this account they're intimately related they should be combined but we broke them out for more presentation purposes and that's how you end up with an asset that has a a credit account now i think quickbooks actually sees it 
as a decrease, even though it's going to go up in, in, a, in a negative amount. So I think they see it as a decrease, but I'm not totally sure. I'm going to just guess, and then we'll see if that's right. So 2, 3, 3, 3, 3 point 5. And then the other side is going to go to depreciation expense. Let's see if they gave us one. They did. So here's depreciation expense. Now on the expense side of things, you have the same you have the same options as we do with the the accumulated depreciation side. You could create a separate expense account for each category: depreciation expense, furniture and fixture; depreciation expense, equipment; possibly housing them all under a parent account of accumulated depreciation. I'm sorry, just depreciation expense and then have all the other expense categories underneath it. I don't I often will say on the expense side, I'm just going to put it into one account depreciation expense. I'm not as concerned with breaking out the different categories on that side. Why? Because the expense is is going to roll out to net income. So unless I need the detail on the income statement, I'm it might not be important to me. If I'm just doing the tax return, I can just Re recorded as, as depreciation expense. I don't need all the categories typically. Whereas on the balance sheet, I, I ha it's a permanent account. The, they're going to stay there. So I would like to tie in what's on the balance sheet to, to my schedules as, uh, as time passes. So that's my rationale there. So let's go ahead and save it. And so if I go back to the balance sheet and check, if we go into it, by the way, and edit it, here's the debits and credits. I'm going to copy the adjusting entry and put it here. So did it do it right? So we credited the, yeah, we credited accumulated depreciation and debited the depreciation. So yeah, it saw it as a decrease, even though it's increased in the contra asset. So let's save that. And then I'll close this, go into my balance sheet and then run it. And so we can see here on the furniture and equipment, it went up from 7,500 to set to 98350 right but it went <laughs> but but so so right but it went up but it, but they, they saw it as a decrease cuz it's decrease in the total assets so then we have the accumulated depreciation journal entry it's a it's an adjusting entry there's the adjustment and there's our new uh, balance okay so that's good and so so then I recorded that portion for two months. Here's the prior portion that we had. So we can kind of tie in per category, right? So I can say, okay, for the two months, it was 14001 divided by 12 times two plus last year's depreciation or accumulated depreciation prior to that 7500. That's the 9833, the book value or the cost was this. So the book value is this minus the 98,000 book value 88166 which we can see here so th so there's the there's the 98000 the 98336 and the book value is 88166 let's do the same for the machinery and equipment now back on over back to my chart of accounts looking for the register accumulated depreciation for for machinery and equipment opening up the register, dropping down for a journal entry as of 022924. And we're going to say this is an ADJ entry. It's going to be a decrease we now know. And let's calculate the amount. So the, the depreciation on the year was uh, 833. So I'm going to say 833 divided by 12 depreciation per month times two. Again, if you just did this yearly, it will give you the yearly number, right? But we're gonna we're doing two months here. So I'm gonna say that's a decrease of 138.33. Other side's going into depreciation expense. I'm not breaking out depreciation expense by category because it's a temporary account and it's just gonna wash out to retained earnings. So I'm okay with that as one category. And then, so I'm gonna say, save it. And let's go back to the balance sheet, run it to see what happened. Que paso esta vez? We're going to say there's this one. There's the 138. If I go into it, we have the 138 going back. So if I check this out, we've got the 5,000 minus the 138. 33 is the 4861767. And the 5,000 is the cost. So there's 
the cost. So that makes sense. And then in total, if I look at my, my total fixed assets, if I was to collapse this whole thing, I get to 9302817. Does that make sense? Let's check it out. Accumulated depreciation total is, well, let's do it this way. Accumulated depreciation for the period was 14001 plus the 833 divided by 12 per month times two for two months. And then that, and then we had the prior depreciation pr plus the 7500. So that's total depreciation over the life or accumulated depreciation at this point, minus the cost, which is the 98 plus the five or 103000. Therefore our total book value at this point should be 9327. Is that what we have here? So we can see over here that it's 9327 round. There's a rounding difference. I'm cool with that, with the rounding. So let's go to the income statement and run that one. And we'll scroll on down to depreciation. So there's our depreciation. Notice I didn't record it in January. I'm not, I'm not gonna try to go back to the past. I'm gonna record it as of two months ended of this point in time. So this is two months of depreciation reported in the current time period that we're reporting on uh, for the two months ended. Right? <laughs> so these are the two amounts. There's the two journal entries, putting them both into one account on the income statement. Not worried about that because that's all I need to report to external users because that will net out to net income and net income will roll out to the balance sheet in, in, in the future and will start over fresh. Unlike the balance sheet accounts where these are permanent accounts which will stick around and therefore I want the more detail to tie into the sub ledgers class by class, furniture and fixture component by furniture and fixture or pp and e by pp and e category you know i actually think this should have been 83 instead of 33 which i'm not really worried about but i'll go in there and change it just to make just to make it exact because i think my calculation was this and i was blind and i saw it as a three but it's an eight so just in case that was bothering anyone that i typed it in there incorrectly it was it was wrong and so now I have I have fixed it. So let's go, so let's go ahead and save it now. So now it's going to be more exact and close this up. So we so, so we so we leveled it up now. Leveled it up. All right. I'm practicing with my soundboard in case. Sorry if that's annoying, but I'm going to get good at it. It's going to be great pretty soon. But there we are. So this is where we stand on the balance sheet and boom. And this is where we stand on the profit and loss P and L income statement looking Mui B to the N. And this is where we stand on the trustee TB trial balance where we have the income statement and balance sheet. Note that this also is not going to be a reversing entry. These are permanent differences. So they're permanent differences, not temporary differences. So we don't have any reversing entry for it. All right. So we're going to say assets, liabilities, equity assets, what the company has, checking account on down through the d -d 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 machinery and equipment. And then who has claim to those assets, liabilities and equity, the flip side of the coin, the debits versus the credits. Here's the main credit balance side of things. You got the liabilities, accounts payable on down through the unearned revenue. And then you got the equity side of things. Our claim to the assets, basically credit balance in total, hopefully, where we have opening balance, uh, owner's draws, owner's investment, owner's equity, similar to retained earnings. And then the entire income statement, revenue, credit balances, minus expenses, debit balances, credits minus the debits on the income statement resulting in net income, which will roll in to the owner's equity, which QuickBooks does automatically on a yearly basis. We can see that if we change the dates to 010125, uh, run it to refresh it. And then we can see it squished it all into the owner's equity. So assets, what the company has, debits primarily, liabilities, equity, that's who has claim to the assets, credits primarily.